Today on episode 171 of the Author Stories Podcast, my guest is Sherilyn Kenyon. My stuff is a mixture, and I've always mixed genres to such an extent, nobody has ever known what to call it, and that was probably the biggest stumbling block I had, you know. I would submit it to Tor, they'd be like, we don't know what to do with this. Hey there, Author Story listeners, this is Kevin Tomlinson from draft to digital and I know that you have a book sitting there just waiting to get out to the world, and you're kind of wondering what the next steps are. So that's why you need to go visit drafttodigital.com slash author stories. That's draft, the number two digital, dot com slash author stories. And that's where you're going to find all the help you need to go from having a book on your hard drive to having it on someone's Kindle or iPad or other reading device. So go visit drafttodigital.com slash author stories right now. Hey everybody, thanks for listening into the Author Stories Podcast. You can find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, click over in the right-hand sidebar and hit one of the subscribe buttons. Uh, it really does help. You can subscribe on iTunes or Google Play, Stitcher Radio, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Or just listen to it right here at hankgarner.com. I'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors this week, thirdscribe.com. Authors, you need an author platform. We've discussed this before. You need to have a place where people can connect with you. Readers, you can connect with some of your favorite authors at thirdscribe.com. Go tell Rob and the great folks over there that you heard about it on Author Stories. Also, Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. Uh, this monthly publication is one of the best things to come out of publishing in the last few years. Uh, Daniel Arthur Smith, very extremely talented writer, good friend of mine, uh, also puts out this publication each month with the best in uh, pulp short stories and continuing uh, drama as it unfolds each month. Go pick up Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. Also, if you love comics the way I do, uh, my friend Ed Gosney has a blog at edgosney.com, and he highlights uh, some of the best comics that have ever been published, and he uh, does a, uh, a showcase each week where he puts together something really cool. Uh, also, you can contribute to cool comics in my collection at edgosney.com. Go over there today and uh, check out what he's done and uh, let him know that you would like to contribute as well. Uh, stay tuned after the show for a short clip from Richard Gleaves uh, from General of the Dead, one of my favorite books of 2016. Speaking of favorite books and favorite writers, Stefan Boltz has a brand new book out called Six String. I was fortunate enough to be one of his beta readers. This book is fantastic. Uh, check in the show notes. There's a link there for something new and altogether different uh, from Stefan Boltz. But if you know Stefan, uh, even though the setting is a little different. All of the heart and soul of his writing is still there. Six String by Stefan Boltz. Thanks for listening. With the oppressive transport authority controlling every aspect of their existence, Leah and her father do what they can to carve out a good life for themselves. Leah spends her night scavenging and risking capture as she hunts for salvage her father can trade for food and clothing. When Leah takes a bag of salvage from a dying stranger, she and her father are plunged into the world of transport and its war against the terrorist organization, Trace. As transport closes in, Leah will need to decide who she can trust and how far she's prepared to go to save her father's life. The Girl in the City by Philip Harris is the first book in a thrilling dystopian science fiction trilogy set in Michael Bunker's world of Pennsylvania. If you enjoyed books like The Hunger Games and Divergent, you'll love The Girl in the City and its sequels, The Girl in the Wilderness, and The Girl in the Machine. All three books are available now on Amazon Kindle. Check the show notes for a link. thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in the adrenaline-pumping new novel Galactic Satori Chronicles. Written by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, this raucous sci-fi adventure introduces Asher, 
a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiance's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. In a desire to better understand humans in order to destroy them, these aliens are projecting their consciousness onto unsuspecting men and women and in the process are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Fueled by emotions that the aliens will never understand, Asher bands together with a group of friends. These four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Asher takes the fight from Earth to an alien spaceship and back again. A fight that will either save the planet or doom it. The first installment in an upcoming series, Galactic Satori Chronicles, is an engrossing look at the manipulation of time, mental projection, futuristic technology, and of course, aliens. By Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, pick up Galactic Satori Chronicles now on Amazon. Link in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I'm very happy to have Sherilyn Kenyon with me on the show. And uh, before we started recording, we were having a fantastic conversation about pollen and allergies. So uh, welcome to the show, Sherilyn. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, man. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? (laughs) Oh, golly. Uh, Yeah, my first memory. It it is so weird. I was probably four or five. No, yeah, I'd been four or five. My mother was pregnant with my little brother, and she was at the sink in the bathroom putting on her mascara. And I, I just trounced in there like a little kid does. I'm like, Mama, when I grow up, I want to be a New York Times bestselling writer. Wow. And I can still see my mother at the mirror stopping, looking down at me like, girl, you are crazy. What the heck have I birthed? And my mom was like, girl, do you even know what that is? I went, no, but it's on the front of your books, and I want to be a writer when I grow up. So it seems like it's a pretty good thing to want to be. My mom just shook her head going, oh, my God, my <laughs> child, she's a changeling. I, I don't know where that thing came from. Oh, dear God, where's my real baby? Oh, that's so funny. Uh, were, were you a big <laughs> reader at the time or, or were you just – what? how old did you say you were? I was four. Okay, five. okay. I was dyslexic. No, I mean, it was weird. I would pretend to read books before I could ever actually read them. I learned to read on, on Spider-Man comic books with my older brother. Oh, my God. I was trying to read. I just, I, I'm severely dyslexic. Oh, I, this is so bizarre. Uh, I am the same way, and I've actually written uh, some blog posts about how reading comic books as a kid uh, helped me to deal with my dyslexia. Um, I am severely dyslexic as well, and I've. I, They're a god. I know, aren't and they? and I. I remember this uh, this moment I had when my mom brought me a Superman comic and a Justice League comic, and and my whole world oh, yeah. changed. And um, Absolutely. yeah, and I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes here where where folks can read more about that. But yeah, that's that's amazing. So uh, right? yeah, um, what what was it uh, when you read that that Spider Man comic that, that your brothers had? Did 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 you feel like that something had opened up for you? Well, it was kind of funny because, you know, let me go back to he was a brother. (laughs) (laughs) So my brother comes in one day and I had been struggling so hard. And he's like, all right, I got one ignorant sister. I ain't raising another one. (laughs) You gonna sit down here, girl, and I'm going to teach you to read. Okay. That's also how I learned to pitch a ball. (laughs) Right. I ain't going to be embarrassed. Same mechanics, right? me. (laughs) Exactly. You know, hey, uh, you go out on that field, you're It's the family here, and I ain't having you shaming us. Right. So. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Um, Yeah, it was. I mean, it it was like the light bulbs turned on, and and I was really, you know, he'd do that. And he, he taught me to read with flashcards, too. So he actually... Um, word recog in a way that, that 
you know, and God love because he, he's 10 years older than me. So he didn't, with no, he didn't even finish high school. Wow. So, and yeah, he, I don't know where I'd be without my brother. Absolutely. I mean, just, yeah, you know, it, it's amazing what he did not to have even finished school himself. Um, so what, what types of things did, uh, started capturing your attention when you, uh, started getting into fiction of your own? Um, with the, I started doing that before I could read. I was sitting there drawing, folk, you know, my own comic books. I mean, you know, my family, my mother was real into the, you remember those old, old horror comic books, like Tales from the Crypt right. and all those. So my mother, my first memories of my life is all of us sitting, you know, today everybody has their phones. But back then, we all had our comic books. Right. And we're sitting around the table. You know, mine was Casper oh, the yeah. Ghost. But I couldn't read them, like I said, but um, not until my brother made me. But um, anyway, yeah. So I, before that, I was sitting there drawing my own little comic strips. And so I was always telling stories That's with cool. pictures. Um, I think I... Uh... People hear that a writer is dyslexic, and they don't quite understand how that works. Um, can you <laughs> talk just a little bit about how, as a writer, you deal with that, and does it affect your your workflow? Um, and I, I think a, a lot of people have some some misunderstandings, and 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 they think that when you look at a page, all of the letters just start running around on the page all the time. And so, if that happens, how do you write? Um, and it's not quite exactly like that, uh, but your your mind does kind of play tricks on you with words, um, and uh, sometimes I'll see things backwards. Sometimes, sometimes it's that I read something five times and have no idea what I just read. I just can't make the connection with the words. Yeah. Um, and and I've you know developed ways to to deal with that through the years. But what it, what about you as a writer? How does that affect the craft? Well, like you said, it, it's, you know, and it's weird when somebody spells something at me or they call out a number. Cause mine's so severe that um, I actually mirror write. And like you said, the thing people don't realize with dyslexia, there are different forms of it. There's auditory, there's verbal, and I'm also verbally dyslexic. Uh, compound words throw me. And you know, it, I'll say something, and it'll be backwards completely. I, I, I'll mix up sentences sometimes, and people will laugh. I'll be like, what I say? And then they laugh harder, and it's like, I don't know what I just said. Please let me in on the joke. Right. You know? um, I, I'm glad I amused you, but I, I would really like to know what I just screwed up. Um, yeah, and when I write... One of the reasons I ended up married to my husband, well, not, there are many, many reasons I have my husband. I love him. But, you know, I was 18 and we were in college together and I was struggling so hard to take notes in this difficult class we had. And he reached over, he saw, and he said, honey, don't worry, I'll take the notes for oh, you. Oh, he was a keeper then, wasn't he? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, really. And, you know, instead of sitting there going, what is wrong with you? What helped me through school, believe it or not, is I actually used to write with a runic alphabet. It was when I actually had to write with an English alphabet. English alphabets are what throw me. But as long as I'm taking notes or if I'm writing in runic, I don't twist the runes around. Interesting. So is this uh, was this a, uh, a a predetermined runic alphabet? Was it something you developed? Um, it's mostly Fulker, but it's okay. some of mine too. Cool. How did you stumble on that? Uh, that. <laughs> I had a weird childhood. <laughs> my, <laughs> my grandfather was a shaman, and he did a lot of sigils and, and different things, and he did a lot with – he had a good friend who was a druid. Wow. So I kind of was around it growing up. That's, uh, that's pretty intense, especially for someone growing up in the South. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> my other granddaddy was a Baptist evangelical right. kind so yeah that that was a lot of fun growing up there we had some interesting bet, family reunions I bet. did oh yeah uh, <laughs> did did some of that history play into your love of uh fantasy and uh some of the the themes that that you write about now oh absolutely i mean yeah 
it, right. how could it not? You know, we had weird family stuff. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Um, at, at what point did you, other than you announcing to your mother because you'd seen it on her books, at, at what point did you realize that you uh, were going to take a crack at writing uh, fiction and, and kind of how did you get into that? Um, I really, I, I was dead serious. Um, the first thing I ever published was third grade. I did a local paper, an essay about my mom. Um, and I just kind of, you know, first thing I published professionally, I was 14. It was a short story cell. Wow. So I just kind of always yeah. pursued Where did it. you publish that? Uh, uh, the first one was in uh, well, the newspaper or Seventeen magazine. Um, it was a little wow. thing I did. Uh, that ha- uh, that was an article yeah. actually. The short story was in a magazine called uh, God. What was the name of it? Um, sort of Scheherazade, which I don't think is around anymore. That had to be uh, such a uh, an ego boost for a young writer to uh to well not only to have written and finished something at that age but to actually sell it uh what did that do what did oh that do gosh, for your confidence yeah. uh, it did a lot to you know, i got the crap kicked out of it <laughs> but you know hey i'm a right, writer right you know yeah it, it was fun i mean i you know i wrote on the school paper and nice. i did some stuff with the creative loafing in atlanta and you know cool. yeah it was fun what was I couldn't get into the creative writing program at college, even though I was published. That, kind oh, of well, that was going to be my next question. What did you study at college? History. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> well, well, you know. Uh, I couldn't get in. The, I was the editor for the school paper. I couldn't get in the journalism Oh, my program. God. I, I, yeah, I couldn't pass the, ta- the typing test. And back then, they didn't. My hands paralyzed, partially paralyzed. And. Yeah, they had a staunch requirement for typing, and this is before we had computers. So wow, yeah. that's and they didn't have allowances back way back in the dark ages. That's crazy! Wow. Um, so at, at what point? Well, first off, a, a, a history degree is is actually a great degree for someone who writes fiction. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Did... yeah. That and, you know, psychology. <laughs> <laughs> right. Especially if you're writing mysteries and thrillers and, and stuff, that's probably pretty good. Um, or hanging out <laughs> with my family. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, what, um, um, at, at what point did you decide you're going to write a novel and, and did you get serious about it? Uh, I actually wrote my first novel at age eight. Like you do. It is not. I, it, it's like a hundred pages. I mean, for an eight year old, it's pretty right. impressive, but you know, it, it's not what it should be today. It was illustrated. It was awesome. You know, it, a little girl who murders her brothers and gets away with it had no bearing on my real, my right, real life right, at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. yeah. Did you share it with the family? <laughs> of course I did. This is what happened to my real little brother, and this is what will happen to you. Right. Yeah, I was that sister. But, uh, you know, today they, they'd throw me in. <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with this kid? Have you met my family? You would know. Anyhow, yeah. Uh, the first one that I actually did, though, in terms of wanting to I, – I did the short stories. They were quick and easy, and I needed a lot of money. Oh, I didn't need a lot of money. I needed food. Right. So, yeah, and – so trying to have the time to do, I was working three jobs trying to go to school. So it was hard to, to find the time to do a full novel. And I didn't have a lot of confidence. I mean, you know, once you start actually selling freelance, you get told no more times than you get right. told yes. So while I had a degree of, I wouldn't even say it was confidence, it was just bullheadedness. I am Southern, y'all. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I kept feeling that, that I was too young, and everybody around me was going, no. I, I, and I don't even know what you – you listen to people when you're young. You know, you're not, you have no life experience, which wasn't really all that true. But, you know, so I waited until I was uh, 18, yeah, almost 19, before I sat down and said, okay, this is it. You know, I've got a pretty good resume in terms of stories that have sold. And I sat down, I wrote Born of Night, which actually is the book that ended up being published. Um, 
and about the time I got ready to submit it, my older brother ended up being killed, and that delayed me a couple of years from pursuing oh, it sorry. any further. Um, uh, thank you. It was it was really hard. So you know, it, it, because I had typed it on his typewriter. Typewriter actually his roommate's typewriter. It wasn't his. He had borrowed it for me so that I could finish it off and get it submitted. And I'd spend a couple of weeks break between jobs getting it typed up. And literally within a day or two of getting it finished, ready to be submitted, he died. And it just, wow. yeah. That's, uh, so uh, obviously you're, you're going through the grieving process and uh, you're, you're dealing with this loss in your family. Um at, at what point did you kind of pick the book back up and say, okay, it's it's time to do something with this now? It, I, I had a hard – my brother was really important to me. I mean, he was sure. my best friend. He was, you know, t- t- calling him my brother is kind of a, a misnomer, really. Um, you know, I, I, we had a very hard upbringing, and, you know, he was my buffer. And without him, it, I had no real anchor. So for a couple of years, I was really lost in the wilderness. And it wasn't my husband and I. It's really kind of weird how life works out. My husband and I had dated. And, um, yeah, we were serious. And my husband did the old, well, why don't you ever take me home to meet the family? You know, we're really kind of serious. I'm like, yeah, I, I like you. He's like, no, you're ashamed of me. Or you take me home to meet your family. I'm like, no, I want to keep you. And if you meet the crazy people I'm related to, you'll never ever marry me. You'll break up with me. And he's like, Oh, please. And yeah. So I took him home and he broke up with me the next day. <laughs> oh my gosh. Cause I, I did not see that coming at all. And it took him a couple of years. And again, it was, you know, that was about a month before my brother died. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so, ha. He came back into my life, though, a couple of years later. And as we were, we'd gotten married, and I was moving in with him. And he came across, you know, the the box of the manuscript and a bunch of other stuff that I'd done. He's like, you know, I remember you were always, always writing, and you've kind of gotten away from it. Why don't you do it? And I'm, yeah, the last thing I wrote, I kind of tucked it in with my brother, and I, I don't know. And I was trying to find a job. You know, I'd done a couple of little small pieces, but nothing major. And I couldn't find work. It was the middle of the recession back in 1990. And I'll get you talk about things that'll knock the ego out of you. You know, hey, I can't get a job scrubbing toilets. That's really, really. I just got married. Right. And, I'm three states away, I've got nothing, and I'm feeling like a drain on my husband here who's, you know, about, he's been called up for Desert Storm, and this is really sucking. Thank you, God. So my girlfriend calls me up, and she's working as an editor for a magazine down in Georgia, and she's like, okay, look, I know writing ain't your sh- no more, but you're starving, so I can throw you some articles if you don't mind. Like, okay, you'll pay me money now I take my clothes off. <laughs> I'm there. It's not illegal or immoral. I can do this. So I went and dug that old typewriter out of the closet. Like, okay, all right, I can do this. I can do this. And I sat down to write. I don't even remember what the article was on. And about three seconds after I touched the keys, all the stories that I had written, the characters and all came back. And next thing I knew, I'm knee deep in wadded up paper and, my husband's coming. I swear it's a time warp, oh, yeah. you know, as a writer. It's like, wait, what do you mean in one five minutes? It's been how many hours? What? Oh, that's... He comes home, and I'm a lunatic. He's like, honey, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd gone home. I, he'd gone to work. I was sane. He came home. I'm a stark raving lunatic. I... I'm a writer. I'm a writer. I remember Isn't that. that how it works, though, that, that sometimes you just need that physical connection, touching the keyboard, and it just yeah. floods back in? Um, I, I, it's yeah. so bizarre. Um, but, yeah, I, I know many people listening to this have, have had that same experience where you, you're filled with self-doubt and, and all of that stuff, and, and you, you put yourself in the chair and it's like that muscle memory just comes and the stories start flowing out when you, uh, it's, you know, you provide that conduit and there it comes. 
Exactly. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, yeah. It, the whole world recedes and. Right. It, exactly. Yeah. Well, back to what you were saying with the dyslexia, that's why it's weird when I'm typing. I'm not nearly as dyslexic right. as I am right. other times. Uh, I do miss words, and they do not always go where they're supposed right. to. Right, and, <laughs> and and that's why it's really important to have a good proofreader because, uh, it, it's, you know, oh, yeah. I think there's a – I read somewhere, and I'm going to misquote this, I'm sure, but uh, when you're editing – uh, when you read over something, uh, if you read over the same mistake like three times or something, you'll never see that mistake again. Your your mind just glosses over yeah. it. And then if you have dyslexia, it's even worse. You may not ever see it on the first time. Uh, it just it's just not there, right. you know. It, and and exactly. then sometimes you'll catch it out of the corner of your eye, and there's a, a glaring omission there. Uh, but it's it's just really weird. Um, uh, so so you you got back into it. Your uh, you were encouraged. You had this manuscript finished. What? How did you get that out to the world? It, you know, back in the dark ages. <laughs> it's when you load it up in a shoebox and mail it to, to somebody. Yeah, basically. Yeah, you had to go to the library and and get the name of the publisher and go call. Find the nerve to call up there and go, "Hi, who's your querying editor? Thank you." Yeah. <laughs> and, and submit and wait, 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 wait. I love when people ask me today, how do you submit? And I'm like, I have no idea how you do it today because I know it's totally different from what we did. We uh, had a little group and we would take turns once a week calling. We'd each have our, you know, the list of publishers and you'd call to find out who, make sure the editors were all still there. But you didn't want to call the same one because you're afraid they'd recognize right. your voice. <laughs> so we'd alternate. You know, today you call tour. Next week I'll call tour. <laughs> oh, that's so cool! So, so you had a you had a squad put together that uh, submission squad. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'll you'll get the latest submission information. Okay, and then once a month you'd have to write up there and go. Can I have a copy of your guidelines? Because occasionally they would change that stuff on you, and you'd have to know. So somebody'd have to send off for it. Because we didn't have the internet yeah. yet. Um, how long was it before that book uh, got published? I had, well, it took me about 18 months to get the first contract. But it didn't come out. To, I sold it in 92. I didn't get the contract on it until – or not contract, sorry. Well, it took a while to get the contract. As you know, you can write a book quicker than you can write a contract. Go figure. <laughs> Uh, it didn't come out until January of ninety six. Yeah, one of yeah. those. <laughs> that's uh, that's it, now a, a gap like that is is pretty uncommon. But uh, a gap of a year or so is not uncommon. Uh, I think a lot of people get in their head, okay, I've finished this book now. I'm 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 ready to publish it, and they start sending it out to uh, to agents and publishers, thinking that it's going to be on the shelf next month, and it doesn't right. quite work that quickly, does it? No. Well, again, though, I mean, it depends on today. The different publisher are, yeah, different publishers do. You know, if you, if you get in with some of the smaller presses, they can get them out right. a lot quicker. You know, so, yeah, even that's changed because my girlfriend's with. Um, or if you self Oh, my gosh, she'll kill me. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, you can get them out a whole mm -hmm. lot faster. Um, I can't believe I can't think of the name for publisher. She'll kill <laughs> me. But anyway. But yeah, her hers came out so qu quickly. I, I was like, "No, what, what, whoa! <laughs> How'd that happen? It's like warp speed." Wow. So, I barely got your quote, and you're out. Wow. <laughs> so, so like four years. Uh, what uh, What were you thinking during that time? I, I, I'm. I would imagine I was writing other books. I had like. Yeah. So, um, did did you finish? Did you carry on that series or? Uh, Kind of what was oh, yeah. your what was your thinking? Okay, this is the first book I've sold. I don't know when it's ever going to come out. I'm just going to busy myself. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean that's the whole thing. I just I kept going with the series, and the first three books in the series came out before the first book, or the next three books came out before the first book did. It was yeah. So it's not always our fault when they're not in order, oh, guys. Wow. What? Uh, yeah, they came out with different publishers. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's gotta be, uh, uh, kind of hard to keep up with. 
Yeah. Man. Yeah, telling the readers, it's coming, really. There is a book one. <laughs> <laughs> Just think of it like Star Wars, okay? We're going to do chapter four first. <laughs> that's, that's a great, uh, I'll have to remember that one. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> um, looking at your website and your uh, your list of book series, um, you said you, you what, what year did that first book come out? 96, did you say? Uh, well, the very first book I published came out in okay. 93, but that one came out in nine. That was the first I sold, but it came okay. out in 96. Okay, so 93. I never did anything God. the right way. In, in <laughs> case you haven't noticed, I, as my mama said, girl, you come into this world backwards. You've been that way ever since. <laughs> so so you've been publishing about 24 years, give or take, uh, at this point. Oh, uh, well, oh, no, it's older it, than, is it? God, I, I can't do math. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. I don't know. Well, your your book counting. series on your website, I, I tried to tally up how many books you've published, but it runs off the screen and I, I just can't get a good number. Um, <laughs> you have um, you have published a metric ton of books in, in that amount of time. Over 100, good actually. Grief. It is over uh, 100. With 30 million or so in print. Uh more than that, like wow. double that. Well, that's that's the the number on your on your <laughs> Amazon page. It says thirty million. Uh, oh, that's old. What uh, what do you credit uh, a a uh, the, your longevity with? Uh, obviously, people find your books and they love them. They keep coming back. Um, but is there oh, is there anything uh, to building that audience and keeping them for that long? Uh, one reader at a time. Um, I, I have no idea. I, you know, I, I don't take it all too seriously. I mean, I, you know, to me, I, it's every book is a whole new thing, and I don't rest on my laurels. I don't. I never believe the right. hype. You know, I, yeah, I'm always learning new stuff, and I'm always trying new stuff, and. I'm nervous with every release. I mean, you know. Oh. <laughs> uh, you said early. I don't yeah. know how I got here. Right, right. right. Um, you started publishing before the internet, like you, you talked, and, and the internet has changed uh, not only uh, the the writing and publishing side, but also the way we connect with readers and fans. Uh, how has that uh, helped or hindered uh, the process kind of in the way that this has evolved and changed? It's much more of a time drain. I mean, you know, back in the day, it, it was a lot easier to get a book done when you didn't have to answer email. <laughs> yeah, there's so much email. They they drown us in it now. I spend probably half my day just, especially on a Monday, Oh, it, it's like email getting. <laughs> what are y'all doing? I can't write the book for the email. Do you mind? That, yeah, that's probably my number one pet peeve. I I wish I could go back to, yeah. But it is nice to be able to, to interact with the fans. I mean, you know, the, the, probably the one thing that that really I hate to have seen go by the way of the dinosaur, the bookstores. I've missed being able to do actual book tours. And in terms of things that have really changed in publishing, you know, it, it's kind of like, remember back in the, uh, actually, I'm assuming, I always assume everybody's my age. You may not remember this. You may be young enough that, that yeah, when you could go into record stores and oh, meet yeah. the band. Oh, yeah. And I have to pay for the tickets like you do now that are, Exorbitant, but you could just go stand in line and meet your favorite. Yes, band. I, I remember that. Uh, I I remember going to buy actual records. You know what? Well, now know, you can yeah. buy records again, but they're like forty dollars, and you know we used to pay seven dollars mm -hmm. for them. But you know, it's, it's right, crazy. right, yeah. Go get it signed by exactly. Mel. You know, and and how cool right. was that? <laughs> right. Now you can't do it for anything. If you get to meet them, you have to buy those unbelievably expensive backstage passes. And yeah, that's yeah. The, the meet and greet is now a, a whole industry. It's, yeah, that's... and it's not like it used to be. And, and you know, I and the same thing now, it, it's harder to get out there. Publishers don't want to tour you anymore. The bookstores, 
there aren't that many of them and they're not competing. And yeah, that, that's the one thing I hate is we've lost while it's nice that I can be online, things like this, and I can talk to more fans in a way I can't get out there and actually meet them like yeah. we used to. Um, speaking of, of book tours and meeting fans, uh, you you have some fans, uh, thousands of them, that uh, when you meet them will show you tattoos of some of your works and, and things like that. What that. What is that uh, – for, for someone to take something you've written and uh, emblazon that on their body forever, uh, what, what does that do uh, You know when you see that? Oh, man, uh, the, it's the most uh, – I still remember the first time, it, you know, I was – at a book signing and I'm unpacking my stuff and the bookseller of all people comes over and I'm thinking she's going to be like, Oh, you can't sit there. You got to move and go to the back of the bus kind of thing. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Where, where do I need to be? And she's like, no, 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 no. I want to show you something. And she starts undoing her pants. I'm like, Oh honey, <laughs> oh, honey, I, I don't know what you're thinking about me. Um, yeah, no, 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 that, that's okay. She's like, no, no, no. You got to see this one. Like, oh my God, we're going to be arrested. <laughs> And next thing I know, she exposes a little bit of her, her hip to me. She's like, look. And it was the bow and arrow. And I went, oh, my God. I think I cried for probably, you know, but I was still crying when people were coming out. Like, ah! <laughs> she got it. It was fun. <laughs> oh, that's, so, that's so cool. But, you know, yeah, it, it, I, you've got to remember, I'm from the family where my little brother showed up a book signing one time. He's like, people, go <laughs> home. Why are y'all here? Don't you understand? I wouldn't cross the street to meet her if she had fifty dollars she owed me. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's God, pretty cool. God love them. <laughs> God love them. Um, what what is it uh, about your work? Uh, do you think that fans connect with the most? So, so you tell these stories that are, if, if people are not, first off, if people are not familiar with your work, you, uh, you write books that are, uh, fantasy, uh, have, have magic, have, uh, all sorts of elements. Uh, sometimes there's a romance element. Uh, kind of, how would you describe what you do to someone who's not familiar with you? I write about people. I, it, it really, I mean, it, it, to me, I'm the person who I don't start with the plot. I always start with the characters. And, you know, the books are about, they're about people. You know, it's usually someone who, who's coming from a, a very adverse background. Not necessarily. Sometimes, you know, like Born of Vengeance, uh, he's a prince who, you know, was very beloved and, had crap happened to him, but, you know, later on, but it wasn't from his childhood. A lot of time, that is one of the prevalent themes, but not necessarily. It depends on the book because, like, it's always starts with the characters themselves, and it's just, you know, I, I, got, I can pitch other people's stuff. I don't know, man. I can't describe my stuff. Lord do, do you God. think of yourself as a fantasy writer? Predominantly, yeah, or and or horror. <laughs> Oh, what is? I started. Did you really? Before. What? Yeah. Uh, when did you uh, feel that that change? Uh, and you going from horror to what we would consider more traditional fantasy? I, you know, I I write the same stuff I've always written, and it's weird. I haven't changed my writing at all. They just change what they ah. label it. <laughs> Which I've been in the business long enough where it's like, what are we calling it this week? Could you update me? Because, uh, yeah, the the fun thing about, and I know this is not, don't listen to me if you're trying to sell a book. <laughs> do not listen to me. I can tell you what to do to shoot yourself in the foot. Because I always say the two things you don't ever want to ask me about, publishing and pregnancy, because I'll scare you <laughs> off of both. I've had a, you know, it, when you look at my career, it's like, oh my God, it sounds so wonderful. No, you don't want my career. It's been er, 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 <coughs> rebuild, rebuild, rebuild. <coughs> um, yeah. So I, my stuff is a mixture, and I've always mixed genres to such an extent nobody has ever known what to call it. And that was probably the biggest 
stumbling block I had, you know, I would submit it to Tor. They'd be like, we don't know what to do with this. I'd submit it to Harper Collins. We don't know what to do with this. What, what have you written here? We've got a, you've got a thing. And I'm like, it's a book. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's a story. What do you mean? I, but yeah. So I, I mix everything. I mean, they're, they're, they're not too gross usually. Um, I can't say never. That, you know, I do have military SF stuff, but, you know, there's always a lot of humor in them. It just, yeah. I, I, so I don't try and, because I read everything, I don't limit myself to when I'm writing it. I don't sit there and go, well, it has to be this. It's, my whole thing is I want to write something entertaining and I want to right. surprise you. Well, your your covers uh, on on a lot of them kind of convey this uh, swords and sorcery uh, kind of kind of vibe about it. Um, what is it about those sorts of things and those elements that really intrigue you? I I guess probably because I was raised by <laughs> wolves. Um, yeah, I was raised in the middle of eight boys. So it's just what I grew up with. And yeah, I design a lot of my covers. And to me, it's something usually that, that is symbolic of what's inside the book. And I try to make it match as close as I can to the feeling of what I think or what I felt while I was writing the book. Gotcha. Um, when you, when you're creating um, these fantasy worlds and, and magic systems uh, are is there any anything that you begin with? I know that you said that you you begin with characters and not plot, uh, but what about when you're world building? Uh, do you consider that uh, kind of like your character building? Does the does the place become a character in in your story? Oh yeah, yeah. I go down that rather <laughs> hole a lot. <laughs> I don't just build a little bit. I go anything worth doing is worth right, overdoing. Right. <laughs> I am Southern, y'all. We don't just build a swing set. Nuh -uh. We build an amusement park in that backyard. <laughs> we don't do nothing halfway. <laughs> right. Is there, uh, yeah, when you're, do you do a lot of pre writing? Uh, like when, when you're doing the world building, uh, do you have a, uh, like, do you, develop some history and some uh, mythology to the world and and then do you include that stuff in the story <laughs> oh yeah i've got language guides i've got grammar books i have the entire akidian universe diagrammed out i can tell you <laughs> if i had to i could sit here and i have the mathematical equation for how many years a karanti year is compared to a human yeah, it's it's terrifying. <laughs> do you, do you ever publish that stuff for fans? I t to a degree we do. Uh some of it was included in the companion. We're actually working on it now with a second companion to come out where I'll have a lot of that because I do have a full like the Endarian history, the Trezani history. I actually wrote the Book of Harmony, which is their religious book. So that, you know, when I refer to these things, there actually is a true book of harmony for the Trezani. <laughs> so that what I'm quoting passages out of it, it does oh, exist. Wow. So, yeah, I, I tend to overdo a lot of, yeah, my kids are going to have fun when I die going, what? mom was nuts. <laughs> is this what she was doing in the basement all those years? So, so not only do you over create, but you're still prolific in the midst of your over creation. Um, that... Uh, makes me feel woefully inadequate. <laughs> I have no life. I don't sleep. My children think that their mother's a bear in the basement. It's uh, horrible. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, you said earlier that you dictate uh, now your books. Uh, what? No. No. I, I no. I'm no. I'm sorry. I miss. I misunderstood no. you. I dictate to the oh, characters. I'm that they sorry. Don't I'm sorry. Gotcha. What, what <laughs> no, is your okay. What is your writing process like now? Uh, do you outline your books before you start? I know you you do a lot of this world building, but when you actually start to write the novel, um, are you discovering the story as you go, or do you begin with a a pretty structured outline? 
No, I write to figure out how it's going to end and what's going to happen to them. If I if I knew the answers, if I I've tried to outline, I'm not that. Yeah, I, I'm not that structured. As you've seen, I can't get through a conversation <laughs> straight. <laughs> Um, a, a lot of people, uh, I, and I'm, I'm kind of like, like that. I, uh, I have a, a few kind of road signs, uh, that, I, that I'm writing toward. Uh, I, I don't do a formal outline per se, but I have some, some story beats that I kind of know ahead of time. Uh, but some folks find that when they don't outline, uh, they just kind of meander around the, the story and, and, and have a hard time focusing and, and making it through that. You obviously don't have that uh, problem be- because you publish so much and so often. Uh, it, what do you do when you when you get into a story and it's maybe just not unfolding like you thought it might? Well, uh, you know, I delete. <laughs> <laughs> I, my son's actually starting his first novel, and it's really funny because, you know, he'll come stomping down to the basement and he'll, throw himself down on the floor oh my god mom you don't know how hard it is to write a book Uh, uh, okay no son i don't (laughs) right because it gets infinitely easier after uh novel 80 right well you know my husband thinks that magic fairies come in at night and do it for me so (laughs) if you could lease those out you would be Uh, exactly right you know because he's just like oh the best ever was my youngest child because you know how kids want the world and we were in toys r us and he wanted i don't know one of those star wars lego things that are nine billion (laughs) dollars and i'm looking at him going honey honey maybe for christmas we can't afford that and he looked at me and said well just go write a book mama (laughs) oh okay you little militant thing you i'll go get right on that for you son oh my god oh my god that's amazing (laughs) that's amazing you know, so yeah, my family does think that, you know, little magic trolls come in at night and do it for me. Um, yeah, sometimes my editor <laughs> does too. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll get that right out for you. Can, uh, can I have right. a lunch break? <laughs> right. Oh, So, yeah. What, I, what was the question? Oh my God, wait, I think I've yeah, meandered away yeah. from it. See, I can only focus when <laughs> right, I write. Right, right. Uh, Magic elves and trolls right, do right, do this right. apparently. Um, on your Amazon page, you have this fantastic picture of you and Giorgio Sukulos. Yeah, ah, I didn't realize that was yeah. on there. Okay, when, when did you meet Giorgio? <laughs> oh my gosh, I was at Comic Con, <laughs> and I'm like the world's biggest yeah. fan. <laughs> And I was signing, and he was signing, and I got through with it. My husband was there, and he's like, guess who's up here? You've got to meet him. I'm like, no way. I don't think I can. (laughs) And my my husband's like, yeah, 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 you can. Come on, come on, come on. I'm going to make you. He took me over there, and he's the nicest man in the world. I got the the autographed photo Uh, and everything. It was so awesome. I love my husband. (laughs) I can tell. That's that's fantastic. Uh, shows like, uh, Ancient Aliens, where, where Giorgio is, is most widely known from, uh, I, I love to watch stuff like that because I, I write weird stuff like that sometimes. And, um, and, oh, yeah. uh, and that is, uh, great fodder for letting, letting stories kind of ruminate and, and grow out of, you know, some of these kind of legendary things. Uh, what sorts of things inspire you? Uh, to to come up with some of the stories you do? Well, a lot of it's my weird child. Well, you know, even Ancient Aliens, what, what got me interested in it, my husband actually saw the show first. And years ago, I wrote that and never could get it published. I wrote that in the 80s. Nobody wow. would touch it. My grandfather, the, the, of all people, the, the Baptist minister, um, when I was a little girl, we were coming back from church. And I distinctly remembered i was second maybe second grade maybe third grade granddaddy do you believe there are aliens on other planets and i'm expecting my grandfather it was right around the time star wars had come out i'm expecting my granddaddy to lose his mind on me (laughs) you know let's face it it would be right down the road for what granddaddy normally did and he looked at me and says well you know sherry the bible don't say that god only created one heaven and one earth so yeah, I think he did. I think How there are. That? 
And fat, I know, right? He's like, fat, I hope they do find intelligent life out there because God knows some days we can't find it here at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, and it, weirdly enough, one of the early stories that I, I did way back in the dark ages was this neat little thing about ancient aliens creating life on Earth. And so when the, the show started, my husband's like, oh, my God, have you seen this? It's the story you wrote when we were in college. I went, what? Oh, how cool. And I watched and went, oh, my God, it is not quite. Right. And, you know, it is what it is. But I went, oh, my God, it is kind of creepily similar, weird. What's in the water? Oh, that's so cool. But yeah, but no, I never could get that. But nobody, and I have so many rejections. It was, the name of the story is actually creation, and nobody would touch it with a ten foot pole. Can't imagine why. But yeah, no, it. <laughs> <sighs> uh, Dang it! Closest I ever came is Merrily Heifetz, who ended up being my agent for a while. Um, wanted to see the proposal for it, and then turned it down. <laughs> Man, well, maybe that'll see the light of day again. Maybe I I could, yeah. But now everybody'd be like, "Oh, she's been watching Ancient right, Alien." Right, right. So pff, now it becomes derivative. <laughs> it's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> but yeah, back to the ideas. I I the weirdness of my childhood. I have a very peculiar background, which comes out in weird ways when I write. Do Do you feel like uh, your your other grandfather, the the shaman? Uh, how much of that comes out in your writing? Oh, a great deal. <laughs> yeah. great how deal. do you um, how do you pull from that without uh, and, and and incorporate that into your fantasy worlds and uh, remain um, um, r- remain uh, cognizant and and respectful of uh, of someone's religion and their uh, their uh, beliefs about the world while shaping that into a make-believe story? Well, I, I think it's because I come from people who have very strong beliefs and very differing beliefs. I'm very much aware of you respect – you may not agree with what's my beliefs, but you respect it. Um, you know, my mother's best friend was <laughs> was a voodoo priestess. Uh, two of my best friends, one's a voodoo priestess, the other's a hoodoo priestess, uh, you know, and I, you know, I have devout respect for all my friends, regardless of, you know, where they come from and what they believe. And, you know, one of my other good friends is Hindu and, you know, it's religions have always very much fascinated me. And so, you know, I, it, it is with devout respect that that what, anytime I'm doing anything, that that when I write, I'm very much aware of the fact that that this is somebody's belief, and and you don't tread on that right. lightly. Right. Um, your your newest book is Born of Vengeance. Um, tell us a little bit about it and where that story came from. Uh, it is. Part of the League, which I've been writing since I was a little bitty baby girl. League characters are, are my military assassins. They uh, yeah, they come from, I had two uncles who were snipers. And, you know, they, if you've ever been around snipers, they're an interesting breed. And my father was a vet, a Vietnam vet. And, yeah, you, you get into some interesting dinnertime conversations around those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, so I, 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 as a small child, the whole idea of assassination politics <laughs> was kind of interesting dinner time conversation. And you listen to it as a little kid, and it tends to shape and form your your some of your world worldviews. And you're like, you know, would that not be an awesome government <laughs> for a futuristic society? What if they actually did do what my daddy says we ought to do? Which, thank God, daddy ain't in control, y'all. <laughs> This is why he's not king, and it's a good thing. But, uh, yeah, so in this one, um, 
Bastion was, his family was one of the ruling, Kiravar is one of, I have nine different uh, galaxies. Kiravar is one of the planets in um, the Arcadian galaxy. And his father and family were assassinated. He got blamed for it. And he's been on the run. And he's trying to overthrow the person who overthrew his family. And it's his road back. And it's just, yeah. I, I'm trying not to give spoilers. It's like, yeah. I- if if someone has not uh read your previous stories can they jump in with this book or where should they oh absolutely so it's uh it it works as a standalone story Mm -hmm. i'm always very much aware of that i you know because i'm that reader i no matter how hard i try i never come in on book one gotcha and your website is sherilynkenyon.com, and there you've got a link for your book series, and they can uh, readers can go and and see everything that you published, and and uh, and figure out where they want to go next. Um, Sherilyn, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. Stay tuned now for this audio clip from Richard Gleaves, General of the Dead. You can pick up the entire Jason Crane series at Amazon.com. There's a link in the show notes. How do we know when we are watched? Do the eyes of a predator reflect moonlight, focusing it on our skin? Do we feel two little spots of white on our neck and bristle with fear? I knew I was watched and I could feel its quality. A man's gaze, like yearning eyes in a smoky tavern. I felt drawn to it. I skirted the pond, and beneath a vine-choked bower, I found the horseman's severed head. The braid at the back had snagged on some twig, turning the dead eyes upward. A dragonfly rode his cheek. It fled as I reached for him. I took hold of his braid, like the vine of a pumpkin, and drew him from the water. We sat together on a mossy log, he and I. Oh, I felt such joy to look upon his face again. I wiped the mud from his lips and nostrils, preparing him to be buried. The Domine could not watch the graveyard always, I decided. I would wait for night to fall, steal a shovel, and do the work myself. A trio of colonial soldiers were raising a redoubt nearby. Thomas, the gravedigger, brought them his own long-handled shovels. He stood and watched the soldiers work with professional interest, as dirt was his trade. Autumn leaves snagged in his hair, but he was too busy tale-telling to notice. The morning's dark business had quite bewitched his imagination. But the big one was a Hessian! One of them horsemen? Head lopped off by a cannonball! He'll be a-haunting this place now, he will, with a hip-hip and a clippity-clop. I'll be seeing headless spooks in my burying ground. Just you wait. And if he can't find his own head, he'll be wanting one of ours. Lord love us. He shivered, hands in pockets. The soldiers laughed at him, but the boy was serious. Our legend had begun to spin itself already, from the lips of our tow-headed gravedigger. Fact and fiction going their separate ways severed, as they often are. I listened with fascination. I had always loved a ghost story, and I'd never witnessed the birth of one before. Ghost stories are a form of history. If we say, three men died building that church and they forever haunt it, we keep those souls alive in death. Ghost stories are the past bleeding into the present demanding acknowledgement of those unseen presences all around us, in our street names and genealogies and on our crumbling headstones. The tragedy of Old Willow, the fall of the horseman, the fate of you or I, these tales are forgotten by academic historians who chronicle only great men. But our small lives are remembered so long as our ghost stories are told. That is why we must tell them and retell them, and keep them kindled in the hearts of our children. You've been listening to the Author Stories Podcast with Hank Barber. 
can find all of the archives of the show over at HankGarner.com. When you're there, please subscribe to the show and leave a comment over on iTunes or Google Play. You can even subscribe at YouTube and Stitcher Radio. Thanks for listening. 